Well, again, welcome everyone. This is our inaugural Innovation Grand Rounds. And I'm Stephen Bopart, uh, Executive Associate Dean for Carl Illinois College of Medicine. And uh, this is really a launch of, of what we like to think of as a new series. It's, a, it's an opportunity, really, for us to come together as a college uh, and, and do so in a very collegial, collaborative, social way and build this community, not only here at campus, but uh, also at Carl and, and across our campus. Um, as you noted, we're also simulcasting this to Pollard Auditorium. So thank you all um, that are joining us from Carl. It's really a pleasure to have you uh, join us too and be part of all of this. I want to I want to thank some important people that have been helping to put this all together: Jim Pate, um, Angie Ellis, Tajibi, people at Carl involved in the CME program and and all the AV capabilities to to really set this up. Uh, the purpose of of what we've envision this Innovation Grand Rounds to be about is, is really a, to celebrate this type of medical innovation uh, here in our college and on campus and, and at Carl. Uh, to, to really do this through bringing in role models and, and thought leaders and people that we can, could engage with and really help inspire us and drive us to think about this idea behind medical innovation. Uh, and then secondarily, of course, it's this community of, of faculty, of physicians, of students, of staff uh, to, to come together and, and to really think and ideate about uh, what might be possible. So I could think of no other person better to help launch this type of, of, of seminar series, Grand Rounds, than uh, Dr. Samuel Chilafu. So let me tell you a little bit about him. So he's the Michael M. Terbogasian Professor of Radiology and Vice Chair of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Mellencrot Institute of Radiology at Washington University School of Medicine. He has joint appointments as Professor of Medicine, Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics and Biomedical Engineering. He also serves as Director of the Washington University Molecular Imaging Center, their Theragnostic Innovation Program, and is director of the multiple myeloma, uh, myelo uh, myeloma nanotherapy uh, program, as well as a co-leader for their oncology imaging program at the, the Cancer Center at Washington University. He's, uh, he's a fellow of many organizations, recently the National Academy of Inventors uh, and other societies, the Royal Chem Society of Chemistry, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Optical Society of America, American Institute for uh, Medical and Biological Engineering, I'll stop there. Um, and then also a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for NCI, editor, and, and on the editorial board of many uh, top peer-reviewed journals. He's um, a world-renowned expert in the development and use of light-sensitive drugs for cancer detection, imaging, and therapy. And um, these and many other innovations have resulted in over, what, 59 U.S. patents, over 300 publications. But importantly, and what we're very excited to hear about, is that Dr. Chilafu shares this vision really for integrating partnerships between medicine, between science and engineering, and how we need to leverage those types of partnerships to, to really address and solve some of the grand challenges that we face in, in medicine and healthcare. So I want to, just with that introduction, please ask you to join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Sam Achilafu. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, have your there. It should work. Let's see. All right. Perfect. Well, I don't know who Steve just introduced. Because uh, that's my, I'm just so much Lefu, and sometimes when I received his email inviting me to be the inaugural speaker here, I thought the real person you wanted to invite didn't show up, and he said, oh, well, Sam is there, so he can show up. Um, but it's truly an honor to be here, um, and from last night when I met with King Lady Dean, and very close colleague, Victor Gruev, that we work very closely. I was one of the saddest people at WashU when he moved because I felt I lost a very close partner. And, and we are just so glad that you are doing extremely well here. Mark was one of the people, the chair of BME. So it just appears that this institution is taking away our best people. <laughs> I don't know if that should make me proud or make me angry. 
but it's just good to see all of you doing so well here, and and I thank you. And then here comes uh, Shwini, that uh, I, I I was amazed that you are here as well. Th that's amazing. I can go on and on and on, but I was told to spend that five minutes or less, and they start. So, I I was looking at the the whole idea. My institution always insists that I put this on. Um, founder of companies that makes no money, and and so I'm not the millionaire or billionaire to ask for funds, um, as well as uh, disclosing LS301 and the cancer goggles that I will be using to illustrate some of the things I talk about. Let me just start with this example. Uh, this Ellen uh, Ochoa, I don't know if you know her, uh, an astronaut, the first uh, Hispanic woman to go to space. And she told us last year, uh, a couple of years, last year in Houston, about her experience. And that uh, she was a little kid in 1969. And one early morning, the mo grandmother woke her up from her bed, brought her to the living room, asked her to sit down and watch a television program with her. And so she had no choice. Of course, as a child, she told us how disappointed she was because she needed a couple of, a few more minutes to sleep before school. But it was a story about the moon landing. And she stayed there and watched the first living beings walk on the moon. And that, that experience was transformative for her. It was the first time she had a purpose in life, even as a child. And so she grew up thinking of nothing else but to become an astronaut. But if you look at her life history, she was not the type of person that should become one. Quantitative science may not be there. But even knowing what they should do to get there wasn't available to her. But somehow this dream was transformative. It made her believe in herself that if somebody can get there, why not her? So some people from even childhood had a very good kind of moon landing story to tell. All of us don't have that. Mine wasn't that way. In fact, my moon landing story was very clear. I will never become a surgeon. And the reason is simple. I used to follow my dad to go to him doing all the surgical procedures and people as a child, all I could see was blood, people in pain. Of course, they smiled afterwards. But then that whole process transformed me. I said, one thing I know I won't do in life is to be a surgeon. And it's ironical today that I work in the midst of surgeons. And most of the research work I do somehow has come back to that. And I get back to that in a minute. Let me simply tell you how my own moon landing stories went. It wasn't straightforward from one dream to the next. Instead, it was convoluted, like many of us are as you go through this. I um, started my research career looking at oxygen transport. And the whole oxygen transport idea was to figure out how we can be able to replace blood during surgery. And this was really motivated in those days by a group of uh, Christians called Jehovah's Witnesses. When they go to do surgery, they refuse blood transfusion. And instead, they wanted to, to just use their own blood. And what happened was that this whole research about finding a way to transiently um, replace their blood during surgery and then put it back after they are done. And so it led us to this few research about blood substitutes. Well, it was challenging, frustrating. It was able to be done, but the fluorocarbons that we are using in those days can trap all the oxygen you want, but it didn't release them efficiently. So when I then moved over to start my independent career, uh, we started looking at liquid ventilation. I was asked to lead the project on liquid ventilation. And the whole idea was to have children that has respiratory distress syndrome. 
the alveolized, collapsed, the lungs, surfactants not well developed. And you find that there are people that they can hardly breathe. These children are in pain. And so I led this group at Malincroft Medical then to come up with this very nice way of throwing liquid ventilation, reduce the surface tension of the alveoli, allows it to expand seamlessly without problems, and then be able to allow the exchange of oxygen. So this was very exciting. I thought, yes, this is the jackpot I need. But I was working for a company. And they've looked at the financial returns and investment and everything. I say, well, in as much as it's working, we don't see a future there. So that's when I decided it's back to go back to academia, by the way, where you can do what you believe will be useful and helpful to humanity with little constraints. And it was at that time molecular optical imaging came in with a bunch of physicists who believed that optical imaging will replace everything imaging in those days. Steve Bopart, you remember? OCT was the one that helped us out because optical coherence tomography then at least had the we had the opportunity of seeing clinical impact. But all the other ones, like fluorescence imaging, nobody saw it. In fact, grant proposals written in those days were summarily dismissed by a review panelists who says it was never useful for anything clinically. And I remember Shumene at um, Jackson Hole to, uh, imaging in 2020. He presented his first um, uh, all these uh, quantum dots. And nobody believed him at all. And I still remember the strong argument with um, uh, Wise Leather um, arguing seriously why it will never be useful to humanity. And I also remember um, Li Hong Wang at the same meeting where he was showing us all these blobs called photoacoustic imaging. And nobody really thought it was going anywhere. And of course, we had fun, but nobody thought about those talks. Today is transformative. And that's one of the things that we are looking at is that as you move on, um, if you have new ideas, if you have things that have not been tried before, if you are starting a medical school like the ones you have here, that's never been experimented somewhere else, there's going to be doubters, there are going to be challenges. But then, if you believe in what you are doing at a point, you are going to see that it becomes transformative down the line. Well, I ended up working on image-guided surgery. Um, Victor, I will talk about that briefly, where we are now seeing the, the application of optical methods. But interestingly, Washington University was known as one of the highest NIH grantees in the country, but then, the worst institution, one of the worst, in translating anything from research to commercialization. So we were high on this end, and I still remember the embarrassments a few years ago when NIH published that statistics. And the chancellor said, wait a minute, we have to change the paradigm. And that was when we hired um, um, our then uh, uh, top, who was a, a provost, and, and he transformed the institution and came up with this program called the Quick License, allowing faculty members, when your arrow one is gone, done, when renewal is done, when you have no more where, no place to go, why don't you transfer, uh, transfer it to become a commercial product? And that's why today we have a very wide boss lane um, uh, uh, energetic program open a whole area now for innovation at Washington University where faculty members with reduced conflict of interest issues can start new companies. And it's really transformed our institution over the years. Funny enough, I seem to have come back to where I started. But looking at it from a different problem, where we are looking at hypoxia, um, cancer cells have these pockets of hypoxia, helping it to create this heterogeneity that allows the cancer cells to survive or evade therapy. 
And instead of using it as bus substitute or liquid ventilation, we've now come up with a completely new system that will not only allow us to trap loss of oxygen in real time, but deliver it to a specific area of tissue of interest. And if it is hypoxic, we know by a change in the parameters we are looking at, and then allow it to release spontaneously in that tissue. I, unfortunately, I won't be able to talk about all this today. But that's it. I've gone back to where I started. And I remember sending the uh, email to Peter Radcliffe, who was one of the three Nobel uh, laureates uh, this year, who was awarded for hypoxia when I was at Oxford. Um, he was actually the one that encouraged me to move forward with oxygen transport and everything. And, and it was good to know that they thought I had escaped, but I let him know that I'm back to the same area. Um, we used to talk about optical imaging in those days in relative terms. That in radiology suite, you have a lot of x-rays that represent an empire. In fact, I used to show this in the 90s. I remember one of the SPI meetings where I said, um, you can see MRI has a mansion. Nuclear imaging, at least you can see it has a home. Ultrasound has a room in radiology suite. But that optical imaging then was just cute but homeless. Okay? And we can talk all about what we want to do, but we have no takers. Radiologists, we are trained in this field, and who will be your partner to translate things? And today, it's so exciting to see that after so many years, that optical imaging is actually an integral part of the whole of the School of Medicine. And any institution that does not incorporate it will be left behind in a variety of ways. Nanosensing using optical methods. Um, sensors that can help you detect a very low amount of materials that are present. In dermatology, real-time imaging and analysis of the state of tissues. Neurology, all the whole things now that's been done with uh, uh, new, uh, brain imaging for children and functional imaging of the brain is done by optical methods. Uh, Jokova is one of the leaders in, in, uh, in, in that whole area. Ophthalmology is all about optical. And in fact, the new method that the contact lens has now been implanted with sensors allows us to use the eye as a window to all human diseases moving forward. So this is really an exciting part that has transformed and allowed us to, to look at issues. And so now you can go from whole body, I mean, uh, organ imaging, uh, looking at take the biopsy directly where you see it. Now you can look at the heterogeneity of cancer as a histologic analysis, collect any type of cells you want from there, do single cell imaging, and use it to do single cell genomic imaging. And optical is the only imaging method that gives you all this large scale um, of spatial scale to be able to interrogate tissues completely. Well, to do that, um, give an example with cancer, uh, I used to describe it to the lay people who have come to talk to all the time uh, as that guest that comes into your house and they, are, they go into your guest room with no invitation, by the way. Um, by the time you know somebody is there, they've already taken over your living room and you hear noise because they are cooking in your kitchen. And by the time you come out to check who is there, they kick you out of your own house. That's the whole story about this cancer progression. But as you can see through that, there are so many complex things that arise through cancer. It's like looking at the elephant, as you know the story. And the engineers will first of all tell you, well, the pipe is broken. Okay, there's a pipeline there. And the biologists will tell you there are too many cells growing spontaneously. And the chemist will tell you, well, there's a fertile ground to develop new drugs so that it can work safely, and so on and so forth. And we are seeing these problems from different angles, but not the whole at any time. And guess what? When you then fix the pipe, the other part is still there. And when you fix the tail, the animal is still there. 
And so that transformative way of looking at the silos that we use to solve problems will not work for a variety of diseases, cancer being one of them. So meanwhile, the patient is wondering, God help me here, somebody solved the problem. And in fact, this was me uh, a couple of days ago when I had my toothache. And of course, it happened on Friday. And never on Thursday, never on Wednesday, on Friday night. Everywhere is closed. I had terrible toothache. I wanted to see a dentist to remove it immediately. There were no takers. And I had to go through this pain throughout the weekend until Monday when I had the opportunity to get my wisdom tooth extracted. Who called it wisdom, by the way? If that's true, I'm no longer wise right now. But the problem is that during this period, no matter what anybody told me, all I wanted was get this pain out of here. Somehow help me out. So while you are all struggling to show how smart you are, the mechanisms of cancer, how we can solve it, the patient is there wondering, how soon can you help me? And I read the good statistics about cancer dropping. Uh, this weekend, we all had it, uh, good news, great news. But if you dig into the statistics, it's actually something that we could have all done a long time ago. People should just stop smoking. I mean, that's a simple solution. Sure, progress has been made in a variety of ways. But can you imagine how much of lung cancer we can be prevented if people can just stop smoking or killing themselves? And so the progress we are making really requires integration. And in our lab at Washington University, we, uh, when I joined Washington University, we were asked, I, I remember telling Gil Yost, who was the chair of radiology at that time, and I told him, I want to create an integrated program a program that will allow us to have different scientists and engineers in the same place that can discuss ideas and then be able to execute it as integrated program as opposed to silos. And what we did was to create this lab that has all the different areas that I've listed and more. Importantly, we have clinicians part of the lab and the clinicians are in different fields of study. And we also have um, a lot of um, students and postdocs from different areas. And so our students are trained not to think in silos, but to have area of specialty yet be able to understand what's happening around them. And by creating that program, today we've moved from few people to about 80 members with multiple PIs in the lab that's looking at different areas, but at the same time, have our meetings to integ integrate with our programs. So I will give you an example of how we have looked at ways of bringing people together to solve common problems. Um, one example is oncologic imaging. And I remember that um, at a time, one of our uh, surgical fellows uh, from China who came to WashU was doing some studies and learned that we are doing a lot of things in optical imaging and said, hey, Sam, is there a way you can help us? And the situation that was brought to our attention was in liver cancer, ACC, uh, in, in, in China, there are quite a lot of cases with that. Preoperatively, you are going to see that this patient has tumors. When you open up that patient, you can see clearly where the tumor is. And so you can remove it, and there's no problem identifying it. But he did say the problem is not with that, it's with these cases which they see quite a lot. Preoperative image will tell you there are lesions here, and when you open up the patient, this is what you see. And so the question then becomes, where exactly is the tumor? You use intraoperative ultrasound to go around the tumor, and then sometimes you can get it, but sometimes you don't know where they are. And if only they can be helped to see this quickly, then they can proceed and do it more efficiently. Oh, by the way, most of these patients die. Um, when they come back, it relapses three months later, and then they die. Um, we will tell you part of the reason for that. And the other one is looking at biopsies, sentinel lymph node, 
where you just removed once a woman is diagnosed with cancer, uh, the next thing is staging if it has spread to other parts of the body, and and then you take these biopsies. Most of the time, they are negative. There is no cancer there, but they are gone. How can we intentionally prevent random biopsy and make it more intentional? Finally, the area of looking at um, uh, um, uh, tumors at the edge, uh, surgical uh, positive margins. In many cancer types, there are a lot of second surgeries that has to be performed because by the time the pathologists finish the analysis and then they find out that there are tumors left behind at the edges of the, tumor, uh, the, uh, of the uh, surgical margin, and now the question is, um, how do you prevent that? How can we do that in real time in the operating room, allowing the surgeons to evaluate and close up the patient without the need for second surgery? So basically, the idea then is to move from this subjective division, uh, decision where the zip code is actually very important in the outcome to a more um, uh, a decisive way that we become uh, much easier uh, to, to work with. So we have very simple plans. We want to eliminate the guesswork where you can know where the tumor is. We want to prevent local relapse, especially for the tumors such as brain cancer as well as other types of tumors uh, that um, can be led to local relapse. And then we also want to selectively kill the cancer cells. And to do that, we have to bring integrated programs. Instead of each group looking at different components, we have to integrate them together in a way that we see everything uh, from chemists, uh, from engineers, physicists, visualization, and then eradication of that. I know that, um, how many minutes do I have? OK, 10, 12 more. Thank you. Um, I will go over some slides for those that maybe the students I will talk with later on, and I will just go to the key points I'm making here. So um, if you look at the tumors, basically you are looking at the variety of ways through which they can survive. The example I gave about the elephant, that yeah, we can find drugs that inhibit different things, but at the end, cancer has millions of ways to survive. And new drugs have been developed. The problem with imaging drugs is that many companies that used to develop contrast agents have closed up or merged into one. So there's no money there. Who will sponsor your clinical translation? How will you take that back? And making all these imaging agents that which one will do specific things will not get us far. Because at the end, there's no market for a subset of imaging agents. And so one of the challenges then we have is that instead of pursuing all these different pathways each time there is a cancer type, can we be able to generate a common pathway that will allow, especially in optical imaging, allow us to get into clinical lab regulatory approval and routine use in the clinic, just like FDG is now being used conventionally. And in our group, we just really make this important discovery that a small molecule that's tagged peptide based, tagged with a dye, synergistically interact with each other to generate this uh, near infrared emitting dye that goes into cancer cells selectively. And then we find that it was very useful for a variety of solid tumors and tumor types, which was intriguing. You don't want to have that as a researcher because everybody will not believe you. Trust me, we've tried that. Uh, do we tell you something is wrong with your assay, something is wrong with your model, something is wrong with something? In fact, we started believing something was wrong with it and had to send it to colleagues to try, and then they came back saying it's doing what we thought. But after many years, uh, we just did find out that what was happening is that it binds to phosphorylated annexin A2, which was really kind of uh, this chronic um, inflammatory microenvironment of tumors. And that that process, if you look at it, it binds with super high activity to it. If you take this cell that has no phosphorylated annexin A2 and then induce it, encode it, all of a sudden, all the cells that express it starts taking up the the model. So that's how we finally found out the mechanism for that. And that is expressed in both animal models and, and, uh, and um, human tissue. 
impressively for us, we did see that it's highly upregulated towards the proliferating ages of tumors, which allows us now to, we just got the FDA approval to move on and start trying this in clinical trials in different centers, starting at WashU, which is very useful. But also exciting for us is that not only is it looking at the tumor cells, it's also looking at the tumor-associated fibroblast, which now allows the uh, pathologies to be able to know the other involved cells around the surgical margin. And so with one agent, you can now be able to do both. Um, with that in mind, uh, we found out the mechanism by which this happens, which is simply that when this fibroblast approaches tumor cells, it's used uh, exosomal transport to send in this annexin A2, which turns to phosphorylated ones and start taking up the materials in real time. So with that, we, we got this FDI approval. We can do clinical trials and, and, and move forward with it as a way of real-time margin assessment. As you all know that um, optical imaging has found a niche in the operating room to look at margin assessment in real time. Steve Bopard and the rest are, are doing the label-free approach that's now being pushed through. And, and the, these instruments are available for use. Uh, here is an example of what's happening this lung cancer by Sunil Singhal at UPenn that is showing how this will work. This uh, patient, lung cancer patient that has tumor there, you inject the dye and then you image, you can quickly see that without problems and you remove them and you are done. So this provides us with, there are other examples I won't have time to go through in the interest of time. But in all, what you are beginning to see is that the optical technologies are available to us. Sorry, I shouldn't have put on the sound there. Uh, available to us to allow us to image in real time where the tumor is. And what's happening then is, well, they are disruptive if you look at that. The technology has very large footprint, and our goal was to find ways to miniaturize it, make it simpler to use in the operating room. And for that, we did use these cancer viewing glasses, um, which is very simple in operation, um, that you have your, your lenses, you have a head-mounted device that can then fit in, collect the data, and, and project it back. And Victor Grave that's here played a huge role in this whole research work, where the idea being that uh, the illumination pattern, how can we leave the lights on in the surgical suite without turning it off and still be able to carry out this imaging analysis? The second one is um, how can we process the whole thing in such a rate that leaves no lack time and allows the surgeons to visualize the tumors in real time? And then, with all that in place, how can we project it into the head-mounted device that allows us to then uh, visualize that? And so the whole process, starting from the video see-through, the optical see-through, and now the cool factor one that is being redesigned, allows us to have different iterations of the whole system for surgeons to wear during surgery. Uh, one of the companies that's been established now working with Microsoft and the rest coming up with even a better system that is well designed to integrate uh, with um, HoloLens and the rest. So we examine in vivo that if you do a small animal model, you will quickly see that, yes, if I take out the tumor that you've seen here, flip it around, and there's something left, I can come back, visualize it until the background auto thresholding is with the background normal. So each animal has as its own reference. And so you, we integrated an auto thresholding uh, system that allows to tell you there's nothing more there, we've removed everything, and that can be done. And now in human studies, it's being piloted where it's, uh, it's used to look at a variety of uh, areas, and I think uh, one interesting point here is that it could be used as a teaching tool as well. So somebody in the hospital can have the students in a classroom and really be able to walk them through in real time without problems and you can visualize what they are seeing as if you are there. So it's an immersion technology that you guys have here uh, that will be super useful as a training tool for students down the line. And then if you take that, um, you can see an example of visualizing tumors, uh, positive margins, positive lymph nodes, and this becomes a real-time event without much drawback to it. And so this is one of the tools that we are developing if you are looking at leaf node biopsies, uh, 
it becomes a very simple way to see which one is positive and which one is negative, and then intentionally only remove what is necessary there. And for example, when you have positive margins present, you can simply look at the tissue and turn it around. You visualize where the tumor is, go back to the, uh, the cavity, the surgical cavity, see where the residual tumors are, and then you can remove it selectively and make sure that that patient will not come back after that. Uh, time will not permit me to talk about the ACC model, uh, but just to point out that that patient that we saw here, when you inject uh, the dye directly through interheparin, through hepatural artery, uh, you will find quickly where the tumors are, but at the same time, you see all these other satellite tumors that could have been missed or neglected without the aid of the system. So this allows us not only to identify tumors, but to see it. And where we are going with it right now, is incorporation of all the 3D images that you have free operatively, and then be able to encode it as a guy before surgery, and then use the fluorescence to pinpoint and reorientate all those uh, virtual reality to get your augmented reality in effect uh, in, the, in the operating room. So that's the story of this teamwork. And I know that um, time is up, and I want to leave it for the others. We can use the same eradication, uh, the same light, turn to a different wavelength, and then be able to excite the patient. Uh, here we are doing photodynamic therapy, or what we call radionuclide stimulated therapy, the, independent of the depth. We've overcome the problem with shining light from outside in, instead it's inside out, using all the Sharonkov radiation from the beta emission, activating light-sensitive drugs to do that. Um, and that's working very well. I can talk with people that are interested in it. I promised to show through in this slide when I was talking with a couple of people today, um, where we've developed this 3D model that allows us to take patients' own tissue, and yeah, this for multiple myeloma patients, take the bone marrow aspiration, and create a three-dimensional structure of their tissue, and then screen all the drugs possible to find which ones they will respond to even before you give it in. And this, this is really ongoing right now, and it's a simple way of making sure we give the right dose to the right person at the same time. So I conclude by saying that really we require these integrated methods to move forward with research, and that um, it required a teamwork to do that. Moving from research concept, uh, to dissemination of information and translation. We are translating it not just to clinical, but also to potentiate its application in the community through a commercialization pathways, uh, which is really exciting for us moving forward. And a lot of people who are useful and helpful for this, I only listing a few of them down here. And I acknowledge Victor, who is here with you, played a huge role with the cancer goggles, which Shanku, his student, um, who is now working with um, Ivy? Apple. Apple. That's where they all go. Um, <laughs> and then a lot of surgeons and collaborators that are working with us. We thank funding agencies and quite a lot of our partnership with others. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Sam. That, that was wonderful. Just nice examples of being able to take this all the way from the idea, the conception, the, the lab, all the way up to the translation in the clinic. One of the formats that we have of these particular grand rounds is that we also invite, we have a few local experts that we first invite, uh, introduce and invite up to, to comment, to reflect on some of what they heard, and also to drive these types of discussions then. So we'll have, a, uh, we'll have them maybe say a few, uh, few comments, um, both here and at Carl, and then we'll open up for this, this, this larger discussion. So just to, to invite and um, introduce those individuals. So here um, on campus, we have Professor Shuming Ni, who's our Granger Distinguished Chair in Engineering and a uh, member of our Department of, of Bioengineering. And at Carl, we've got Dr. Sini Sistanik, who's the Medical Director of the, the Cancer Center there. So I know um, Dr. Sistanik has a few slides, but maybe as we load those, we can have uh, Dr. Ni uh, say some comments. Yes. I used to give large lectures. Uh, do, I, do I really need this? <laughs> yes, I, I can hear you at yes. yeah. So that way they can hear you at uh, Carl as well. Well, it's uh, wonderful to have you, Sam. It's always nice to have you.
and known your work for quite some time. Again, I make the comment that all the good people from Washington are here, <laughs> including our department chair and uh, Victor Gruev. And I, I even came here a couple of years ago. And uh, you know, uh, Sam and I have some very similar path. I, I started uh, as a mathematics person doing quantum theory, these kind of things, but eventually focused on uh, bioinstrumentation, bioimaging, especially image guided uh, in surgery. Uh, I just want to, uh, I came here after 15 years in the biomedical engineering department at Emory and Georgia Tech. And uh, our, uh, actually, my, my interest in uh, image guided surgery started with Obama. Okay, there's a good thing about Obama. Because that was 2008, and uh, the federal government needed to support some transformative programs, uh, the stimulus packets. At that time, there was this young surgeon, assistant professor, Dr. Sunil Single, and he's now a big shot in UP, but at that time, he was. Uh, Young surgeon there starting out, he, he taught me all of these challenges in oncological surgery that he was facing, especially thoracic surgery. Then I thought that, well, we can help. Okay? We can develop this molecular imaging, the devices to help you, guide you. And we started in 2008, and now it's, 2000, uh, now it's uh, 2020. We've been working together uh, for 12 years. And we had three NIH grants. I have to confess to this audience, these three grants, we uh, uh, exceeded the proposed goal. All my previous NIH ones, we never achieved those goals. Huh? So, if, if I look at this, it's clearly medicine and engineering is becoming very interdisciplinary. Okay? You, you know, we work with surgeons, we work with pathologists, radiology imaging and the medical oncologist, including the statisticians, and of course engineering. You have the, the materials aspect, you have the electrical engineering, and uh, you have the chemists who develop the imaging and therapeutic agents, and the computing people is playing a very important role. Okay? So I, I think I, I agree completely with you that, that, that you know, there, there, there's this convergence of dis of you know, different disciplines, you call it silos, uh, working to address a important problem. Okay, cancer, cardiovascular disease, and now we have the Alzheimer's. You know, all these important problems waiting for us to working together. Okay? And uh, at the same time, I, I would like to say that you, you describe the process from the conception, the research, development, commercialization. Actually, all of those steps from the fundamental research all the way to commercialization, all of those steps are important. Okay? And even in the image guided surgical or intervention field, uh, optical imaging, other imaging, there are fundamental science problems and major technological problems we have to address. For example, uh, I like to say that in the optical imaging, the penetration depth, because light scattering is always a problem. Okay? And even you go to the near infrared and even to the near infrared two window, and there's still some issues. You cannot penetrate the whole body. Okay, so you know uh, there are very fundamental issues that we still need to to address. Okay, and uh, uh, how much more do you want me to talk? Well, I think that's a good summary. I think that um, you know just to have your see your perspective. You know, and impressions of this. I think maybe we'll go to Dr. Stanek too. Okay, and okay. Get his comments, and then we'll come back and we'll open it up for all these. Okay, I, but I, I do want to say a couple of things yeah. about where this whole field, the image guided, not only surgery, but interventions, including uh, biopsy, screening, you know, these kind of things are going. Because we've been working on this for too long. So I have my own personal opinions. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Stanek, get Carl there. Um, we put your slides up here. I can advance those if you want to just lead the discussion and make some comments. Thank you, Dr. Bobber. Thank you. I would like to thank two associate deans, Dr. Illinois College of Medicine, Dr. Bobber, and Dr. Rovis for inviting me to be on this mini panel. I believe Dr. Achille who gave a nice presentation and showed multiple examples of how 
better imaging can improve surgical therapy in patients with cancer. I would like now just to show, how can I go to the next slide? Oh, Steve. Steve will do it. Okay, next slide. So I have nothing to disclose, and I would like just to show three examples and three challenging situations that we see in oncology and to the end to the spectrum of challenging dilemmas that we have in oncology that Dr. Akilifu described. So this is a 66-year-old male with history of a stage 1 lung cancer. The patient received a pinpointed radiation to the area of tumor right here. And now, almost three years later, the patient has a small lymph nodes. And those lymph nodes, are those cancerous lymph nodes or no? We don't know because the CT scan will show lymph node as abnormal and will be taken as abnormal only if the lymph node is above 1 cm in short axis. And PET CT scan has a very limited ability to show us the positivity of lymph nodes less than 5 millimeter in size. And next slide, please. This is an example of a patient with glioblastoma multiform, a grade four. This is a deadly malignancy for the vast majority of patients. And we can see the tumor extend before and after surgery. And the question is, where is the residual disease? Is the residual disease just here or the residual disease goes more? As Dr. Akilifu pointed out, we need a better ability to, have, to visualize microscopic extent of cancer. And we definitely need histology imaging. Next slide, please. This is uh, imaging with what we believe to be the best imaging study in nuclear medicine FDA approved in the United States at this time. And this is a PET CT scan with full cyclovin. This gentleman was diagnosed with prostate cancer years ago. He failed in the lymph node and I did SBRT. Several months later, I PSA and evidence of multiple osseous metastases telling us that the patient likely had occult disease not visible at the time of this imaging. Next slide and the last slide, please. So definitely, when, if we try to summarize current status of cancer imaging, we can definitely say two things. We have a limited sensitivity and specificity. Even the best imaging studies in nuclear medicine and, 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 uh, uh, and magnetic resonance imaging do not have a specificity higher than 90%. And definitely limited ability to accurately visualize cancers less than five millimeter in size. Those are the biggest challenges. Dr. Akilifu talked about histologic imaging. There is no doubt that this can make, make a significant difference and also margin status evaluation and uh, fluorescence guided surgery. I believe that those advances can revolutionary change our approach in oncology. Wonderful. Thank you very much for those comments, too, and that clinical perspective. So maybe if we can have uh, Dr. Chilifu and Shuming come back up to the front here, and, and we can field questions and other comments and specific uh, thoughts that, that the audience might have. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll start with just here, audience here. Any questions for any of our individuals and speakers? Here. Hi, uh, my name is James and I'm a medical student. I guess what I'm wondering is the technology seems to be, from what I can understand, the image led surgery is integrated into like the, the glasses right now, but I know increasing numbers of surgeries are laparoscopic, so can this technology also be applied to? the vision that we have in laparoscopic surgery as well? Yes, go ahead. That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, if you... Thank you. We, I did show one of the last slides. I'm sorry I couldn't get into it. It's about the virtual reality, augmented reality that's now being encoded into the glasses. Um, it's happening already. Uh, because all you need to do is to integrate. In fact, Victor knows about that very well uh, because we are working on it. And now it's moving forward um, with um, collaborations with um, Microsoft engineers to use the color lens to do exactly that. And it become the readout for all the imaging for 
Intraoperative laparoscopic or endoscopic applications. Yeah, I, I just want to add that uh, surgery is clearly going toward minimally invasive uh, or laparoscopic and uh, even robotic uh, assisted uh, surgery. So we, we do have an active program with uh, 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 Victor Gruff here as well as you, Pence and you, Single. And to develop uh, these miniaturized devices that would allow uh, the surgeons to operate under minimally invasive conditions. So it's clearly a big trend. And the Da Vinci, uh, the intuitive surgical, okay, the dominant company uh, doing this business, they bought the, uh, uh, what was the company? The Canadian company. And for uh, image guidance uh, with the, uh, uh, in their robots, uh, I've heard from the clinicians, it's not working very well, okay? So there's still some uh, <laughs> engineering. Uh, yeah, they, 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 they're selling it, but, but it's not working very well. A lot of things they cannot see. Okay. Question here? All right. Um, first, I have a comment and a question. Really wonderful presentation, Sam, and uh, it, it's been great to hear your overview and perspective on you know, taking this technology and an idea, concepts, right, from the bedside, from the bench to the bedside. And it's really been wonderful working with you. And I think one of the things that you really shown, you know, or was it 19 years working at Wash U, as we talked about yesterday, was 19 years, right? <laughs> Your anniversary uh, working at Wash U. <laughs> and, um, you know, just working together, I think, crossing those silos is how important it is, right? I think you've demonstrated it so well, right? Just have to get, you know, both engineers, physicists, chemists, medical personnel, everybody on the same board with the same idea and the same uh, perspective, right, to, to achieve these goals, right? And if you want to go further, you know, we, we really need to work closer uh, together. We hope we can continue doing this in the future and you know thank you for leading this effort and ensuring what can be achieved. Um, it's wonderful to see how much LS301, you know, you've been working on it for a decade plus, right? And finally <laughs> finding I think it was wonderful to see knowing uh, how uh, efficient it is. And I want to hear your kind of perspective, you know, what's next for LS301? You, you mentioned commercialization and where do you see some of the challenges are there and you know clinical trial and uh, essentially going beyond the clinical trial? Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Victor. And I, as I used to mention, um, I I have so many collaborators that I work with at Washington University and elsewhere. Um, Victor was really somebody that helped us, we have a big RO1 together, worked as a team to really demonstrate that um, something positive can come out from nothing. And, and so I, I thank you very much for that. Um, the LS301, yeah, it took us many years because nobody believed what we were seeing. And that's part of the challenges we face all the time. Um, if it's too good to be true, then cannot be true. <laughs> okay, so that's the approach that all reviewers take when they look at your, phone, your proposals and all the rest of those things. So um, if I was in industry or if I won big lottery, um, the news about LS301 would have been out more than four years ago. Um, but I don't have that kind of money and I need NIH funding. I have to tell them how it works for them to give me money. Um, and so that's the challenges we all have to face and deal with it before you move forward, even if it's working perfectly well, unless you have somebody that wants to support you to say, go ahead anyway. And if you look back into many of the drugs we are using today and the rest, nobody knew how they worked. <laughs> but mm -hmm. good, the difference is that if you are in an industry, they can move forward. If you're in academia, you have to prove yourself every time. So for all those new engineers that are going into this phase of medicine, please help us to find algorithms to figure this out. That will be helpful down the line. So now that we figured it out and we know the mechanism by which it works, it's a wonderful agent for drug delivery. Uh, and so we found that already demonstrated 
how you can use it, send to all types of tumors and different types of drugs and release them in not just the tumor cells, but also the infected cells around it or the transformed cells around it. So that's one area that we are pushing it into. We've also created a multimodal imaging analog of it that allows us to see the current image non-invasively. And then when you go in for the surgery, you cannot visualize exactly where it is using the fluorescence. All right, thank you. I wanted to ask if there's any questions with our Carl colleagues. Um, is anyone yes, there that I, could speak into the mic and? Steve, I do believe that we have some questions, so from uh, audience. Uh, Dr. Daniel Burnett, MD, PhD. Could you please come here, Daniel? Yeah. Yes. And he's coming now. Very good. And then, uh, Steve, if that's okay, we will have another question from Dr. Hua Li. Okay. Dr. Burnett is first one. I, I was wondering if you could speak on the uh, state of clinical trial development. You, you, you have just addressed, to some degree, the, the difficulty of starting with say 5,000 viable reporters, and that funnel gets very narrow down to, say, 10 funded clinical trials. Would, would you be able to, to speak a bit on, on NCI's role in leveling that and opening up the uh, clinical trials for these very promising reporters and technologies? Yes, yes. Let me, let me uh, address this first thing, uh, Sam. You can, you can add to it. Uh, you know, for even clinical trial, you need the IND uh, to be approved. Uh, we've been having quite a bit of success uh, with uh, uh, UPenn as a collaborator, uh, essentially in two categories of uh, molecular imaging probes or tracers. One is the monoclonal antibodies that's already approved by the FDA for uh, immunotherapy. Then you just uh, uh, link that to a fluorescent dye. So that is, can be quick to get approved for application. It works, okay? It has all of the pharmacokinetic, the, 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 the kind of issues, the long, uh, you know, uh, uh, blood circulation time. You know, it's not ideal, but certainly it's work. You will see clinical results on that. It looks encouraging. But most recently, uh, with our collaborator, Philip Lau at Purdue University, he's a medicinal chemist, he developed these small molecule mimics. Okay? These are small molecule and that targets the, uh, the, the, uh, the prostate uh, 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 membrane-specific protein and the folate receptor. And these kind of targeted small molecule tracers, they get cleared out of the body very quickly. They bind to the tumors. And we have a, a cocktail about uh, a four of these things. And we're doing clinical trial with a single single at UPenn. Of course, you need a company the company is on target, as well as the uh, another company at Purdue, uh, Indosite, okay, to work with you. So that's why the collaboration is so important. As a matter of fact, I think one of the frontiers. I, I look forward to read your paper on the LS301. It's coming out, right? Okay. So that's clearly a, a, a at the frontier of targeted tracers for uh, image guided interventions. Okay? I, I think not only they target the tumor specific receptors, but with the cocktail uh, combination of these things, you can even differentiate. Okay? You can even predict the prognosis of these things. So, that's correct. Um, and one other point I want to make is that the NCI is playing a huge role in the, what they call the design program. Um, that's one way they are trying to clear the bottleneck with um, the number of new agents that get into the clinic or approved by the FDA for clinical trials. I think the major issue we have, if you, even if you look at uh, John is here, uh, nuclear imaging where um, every year you get like um, 20 new agents that have gone to human phase one through the um, uh, EIND, which is much easier to get through, um, they still do not proceed further. There's one major elephant in the room, uh, that is reimbursement. Who will pay for it? And you need to figure that out with all our cool imaging agents. If they don't find out who we pay, no hospital will be buying it, no clinician will be ordering it, and so forth. 
So the economics of medicine is one of the reasons you have that bottleneck until you identify something that um, that we get reimbursement. I don't think we can go too far. Um, maybe we take the same approach that was used by our new current uh, director of um, imaging at NIH, um, uh, Larry, um, who who first went to CMS and told them about PET imaging using FDG, and they didn't want to fund it uh, until it was pushed to them that here is the image before, here is the image after, and they saw the visual critical uh, importance of FDG, and that was the only time they approved it for, for use, and then all of a sudden, everybody uses it today. But um, the optical area, we need to do similar thing to clear the path and then open up the way to commercialization down the line. That's my Very good, thank you. There was another question, Carl? Steve, if you're okay, if we have a time for one more question from uh, Dr. Hua Li, she's PhD and she's a medical physicist at Carl. Wonderful. Hey, Dr. HF, this is Hua. I'm the medical physicist here and also the joint faculty in UI. In fact, like other WashU people, I moved to here last March from <laughs> the Oncology Department at WashU. So I really enjoy your talk. <laughs> I really enjoy your talk. I, like Dr. Stanley mentioned in our radiation oncology, we encounter the challenging to give the patient a more accurate like treatment plan, or treatment, so like a limited sensitivity and also for the small tumor size. So we use a multi-model image for the treatment plan guidance and uh, onboard imaging for the patient immobilization and the setup. So I would like to see your opinion about uh, if there are any possibility when we, when we combine the optical imaging with other multi-modality imaging, how the future like a uh, research direction or the challenging to come but all is multi-model image to increase the, uh, how to say, to improve the treat cancer radiation oncology treatment. I would like to see your opinion and uh, learn from that. Thank you. Thank you so much, and um, and, and thank you for the comments. I, I think um, in the radiation therapy world field, um, uh, image guided surgery with view ray today is um, one of the most exciting things that's happened especially for um, the abdominal peritoneal cancer that keeps moving from one place to the other and, and you can adjust that on the fly using MRI. I wish I wish targeted MRI is really a conventional way of looking at focal imaging. Um, but you need so much the sensitivity in terms of um, the amount of materials you need to detect that is just is so high that it exceeds the receptor densities that you can find in most cancer cells. And so I know that different groups are coming up with um, different ways of uh, accumulating more materials, maybe using, uh, I thought that's where Schumann knew we'd be going with this uh, quantum dust and nanoparticles, which will allow you to to have this multivalency and increase the number of targeting groups for MRI imaging down the line. But what I think could happen is that um, if you want to use PET in that, con in that approach, then that we have the opportunity to combine the PET with CT uh, so that it will give you the structural landscape and then you can use the PET to look at the changes that are occurring. So that's one way I think will help us to move forward. Another way that people are trying right now, I just alluded to it and passed through it in the last spring, which is the ways of using Sharonkov radiation. Um, when you use your X-ray radiation, it generates this nice uh, visible light in the blue range that you can use to adjust your treatment planning. Um, I think that that could be a future of harvesting the, uh, the Sharonkov radiation from X-ray accelerators and then use it to adjust on the plan where the patient goes. So that's one way I'm beginning to think that um, well, we can coordinate it with our photosensitizers and then potentiate the therapeutic response using that approach. Very good. Okay, thank sure. you. Steve, I have a physical.
petition in the audience who is asking, if possible, for a very brief question for Dr. Akilifu. And uh, if you allow, I have Dr. Georgina Cheng, MD, PhD. She's a gynecologic oncologist at Carroll. And as you know, Oh, she actively collaborates with the University of Illinois and does basic uh, science research there as well. Georgina, please. We'll, we'll see what question comes up. So, yeah, please. Yeah. I, I just want to add uh, to uh, Hua Li's uh, question about the multimodality imaging probes. You know, for a, a research area, uh, it, it's very exciting. We've seen quite a bit of uh, recent work uh, by several groups uh, uh, developing uh, uh, PET spec uh, with optical imaging. So they complement each other because optical imaging has the limitation of penetration, uh, but allow you to visualize everything in real time, uh, real feedback. And, uh, whereas PET, you cannot do that real time, but it gives you three dimensional. So uh, cer certain exciting development, it's very interesting uh, work. On the other hand, you're talking about the, 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 the translation, and the argument is that one modality is difficult enough to be approved, and you combine two, it's not double, it's probably quadruple the difficulty. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. So, A lot of effort. Huh? A lot of extra effort right, yeah. for those dual yeah. modalities. So, yeah. as a matter of fact, I, I think that Stephen Bopart work in the label free, that's another area, <laughs> you know. Uh, forget about all of these tracers, you know, just label free, you, you use, a, use brute force. You differentiate all of these kind of, uh, of course, it has own other there, There's limited, yeah, there's yeah. limited numbers of, of contrast, you know, techniques and, and metrics you can use, but, uh, but there are, I think, advantages in those scenarios, too. Yeah. So, so, so very quickly, I just want to say a couple of words. Uh, I know the time is short. That there's still tremendous opportunities in engineering technology development in this whole field, especially with the robotic navigation, mm -hmm. with uh, the computing. The, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, AR augmented reality, okay, and the, the computer vision, you know, recognition, these things, imaging, computing. It, it's tremendously. Or, uh, opportunities here. So the engineering students, you know, should really jump into it. But more importantly, we need to train King, a new generation of physicians and surgeons <laughs> who feel comfortable sitting uh, together with uh, with us, with the engineers, talking about these things. Should not be afraid of talking about photons, electrons, plasmons, all these things. So we need a new generation <laughs> of medical students. You speak to our heart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, so was there one more question that Carl? I wanted to, to make sure that was included. Uh, yes. So I appreciate um, the talk. I um, you know, I look forward to hearing more about the human clinical applications that you have been doing in the research and the results that you have so far. One of the as a GYN oncologist, I do sentinel nodes on a regular basis. One of the limit limitations that we have right now is with the growing BMI and the obesity crisis that we have going on around the world is that the depth of penetration and as well as background noise on these types of images are really hard. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that's a real issue, uh, by the way. Um, uh, looking at obesity and 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 one e e e uh, exciting example is how you can start looking at the transformation to diabetes using just the eye ahead of time five six years before it happens so imaging will play a huge role maybe in helping prevent obesity and and um, diabetes down the line yeah um the the if there's good news from it is that um the fat tissue, such as the breast, actually is very much amenable to optical imaging in the near infrared. Um, that's one, if there's anything good about it, that's one area. It's also good for the brain just because you have fat tissues everywhere. If there's a way to make the skull transparent, we are home free. Um, and, so, and by the way, that's an engineering problem. There's, there's, there's a way to make the skull transparent. So think about it. Let me know when you find the solution. Um, the, the key thing there then is that if we are looking at 
the breast density and all the rest, you have to increase the laser power to get enough light to the target and get what you come by free. Um, I, I believe that there are complementary imaging modalities in our institution. We are combining two technologies right now, which is our thermal with fluorescence imaging to overcome that problem because we can now be able to get through and confine our thermal with our fluorescence. So I, I think a multimodal approach for obese patients will be the way to go. But in the, in the context of intraoperative surgery, um, that's why a lot of fluorescence imaging techniques have moved in that direction. The tissue is right there. You've gone through all the obese thing, and you can see within a centimeter deep, and hopefully that will be a window or a guidance to where you want to see whether it's positive lymph nodes, whether it is positive margin or residual tumors on microscopic level. Um, I think that's a huge problem that imaging should help prevent, hopefully down the line. Um, but in the context of that, I think we are using multimodal approach to solve it. Can I just comment about uh, a little bit about the obesity uh, fat? So we've, we've studied the optical property of all the kinds of tissues. Fat, especially like heart fat, not the soft fat, but heart fat, is a very difficult tissue to study. We would rather have the liver rather than the fat because it's white, reflect light in every liver. It's hard to really get into it. So we have not uh, carried out the study, but something that we definitely want to do. If you embed some of the tumor cells in the fat, I don't think it can happen. It, it's kind of screen. It, it's, you know, if it's completely white, there's nothing to do. There's the light simply won't penetrate. It's just reflecting out of it. But my surgeon colleague, it's a little thing. They are not related to fat. They say that fat is not essential, it's not useful, it can always be out of that. <laughs> so they are not afraid of fat. <laughs> yeah, that, that fat is a little bit different. Like the breast fat is different. We're talking about the hard fat accumulated inside some of the meat age of men. <laughs> it's very hard to kill. <laughs> our last question here. <laughs> so thank you very much for the talk. I um, found it very interesting. And I appreciate your analogy about cancer, someone in the kitchen, and by the time you realize it's there, they're kicking you out, right? Which is also kind of thinking about um, death and tragedy. And also what you said about the toothache and um, how then the attention is on the person who has the pain and they want, like, what can be done about it. So I'm thinking about prevention, and I'm reading um, Azra Raza's book about the first sale with cancer and how she talks about um, for us to maybe put uh, more energy in terms of thinking about how we catch that first sale and as it's dividing and as the, it's getting its blood supply, thinking about what modalities are there. So two questions. One, what you're developing, can it relate to that or apply to that in any way? And if not, um, what ways does your lab kind of think about prevention and kind of the community and bringing them in and helping them to drive some of the dis discoveries? Because also when we talk about democratizing health innovation here, those are some of the things we're thinking about. That's so cool. Actually, I discussed this topic with the dean uh, this morning about prevention. Uh, we, uh, the whole idea of um, students not going into preventive medicine, there's not that much money, and so they go to specialties where they can at least pay their tuition and reimbursement and feed their families. Um, hopefully with the plan that you guys have here in place that we change that into the future and the Kaiser program that is coming up, uh, where prevention will become the key. And you can prevent, the problem we have today is that we have disease care system, not really health care system. Um, you have to be sick before you will be seen. Um, you typically, even when you go to the annual physical, most people don't even show up for that. And so, and so we wait till we are sick. And the problem with that is that your baseline is not known. And so the first time you are being diagnosed and looked at, 
the baseline is somebody that already is sick. And, and I think the first thing in relation to that is to start looking at the healthy person so that we can get the whole baseline for the healthy person, be it through imaging or through different type of uh, uh, blood analysis and so forth, so that when those changes are occurring, we can then be able to predict the onset of disease. And I think that's the best tools that we can use, both from imaging and diagnostics, to help maybe diagnostic a point of care settings, not in hospitals or uh, point of care settings, to be able to establish the baseline for each person, individualized baseline. For example, my blood pressure, I went when I had a tooth problem, my baseline, they did my blood pressure, they say it's 127 over 75, it's very good. For me, that's terrible, okay? That, I'm almost dying, and they think it was normal. Uh, uh, my baseline is 110 over 65. That's typical for me. And so I told them, no, that's abnormal, but they think it's normal. So if we have a way of establishing the baseline to define the normal person, then we will know earlier on when to start looking for abnormalities down the line. And developing kids to establish that is one of the primary ways that engineering students or medical students can do and solve. And you have the world experts in nanotechnology here uh, who can help you build sensors that will be able to help look at multiple things at the same time. So that's one way of doing it. At a single cell level though, it's very challenging because we know that cancer doesn't stand out as separate from normal cells at that level. And, but there are a lot of things that happen before it even takes place. So if we can start understanding the normal person, we can be able to solve. So Sam, Shuming, Sinisa, and Carl, thank you all for your comments and your perspectives you, and insight. This has been, I think, incredibly inspiring, motivation, uh, motivation for us to go forward to and think deeper. Thank you all, the audience is here, and uh, Carl, for your questions and thoughts. and. Uh, I know uh, Dr. Chilfu will be here for another 45 minutes or so. Uh, if students want to interact or other people have questions, but uh, let's all thank all the speakers and everyone once again.